hi everyone. Um, I'm really, my name's Erin, um, as you know, uh, and I'm really excited to be here with you all. Um, in fact, you know, you're all so smart, so funny, so creative, it's kind of hard to follow you this morning, so bear with me. Um, but thank you so much to the conference organizers, to the other speakers, to the sponsors for putting on this terrific um, conference. So I've been working at the intersection of higher education and technology um, for about 10 years, um, most recently in libraries. And I can't tell you how excited I was to learn of this conference that's devoted to the joy and surprise and excitement of computing. Because I think that's a vision that we desperately need more of, right? It's a vision that's being threatened by a very different kind of use of computers, right? The use of computers to control and exploit human beings. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more of that, right, every day in our personal lives, in our workplace, uh, in institutions of higher education, and also um, more recently on this very campus. And so um, I wanted to just start this talk uh, by expressing solidarity with the graduate student workers at um, the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, and across the UC system and across the country, right, who are fighting against unjust labor practices and for their right to uh, a living wage. Um, as we uh, heard from um, Saham Banerjee yesterday, right, uh, more than 50 graduate students were fired, and that's putting their right to be in the, the US at risk, or many of those um, folks, um, and, and jeopardizing their education as well. But I think um, we should really thank these graduate students because their action reminds us of the, the type of agency that we have when we work collectively. And I'm mentioning that because, you know, we're on the campus of, of UC Santa Cruz, but I'm also mentioning that because it happens to be the theme of my talk. So today I want to talk about three things, um, technology, education, and ed agency. And by agency, I mean our ability to critically understand the world around us and to shape it according to our own interests, right? Not according to the interests of, of the status quo, of the powers um, that be. And what I want us to think about really is what does you know, liberation look like in an increasingly programmed world, in a world in where more and more of our activities are, are being monitored and influenced by, by computational um, uh, technologies, right? Or if, uh, if liberation was a Python function, as I've imagined it in my title, which of course it is not, um, you know, how would we define it? And how uh, would we teach it? Um, and just to be clear, you know, let me start off. I am not a programmer. I'm, I'm a bit of an outsider at this conference. I'm not a developer. Um, I don't work in the industry. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really coming to you as a messenger from higher education, a messenger from, from academic uh, libraries to really tell you that we need your joyful approach of computing um, in higher education. Um, or to say it in sort of the um, soap opera language of this conference. Um, <laughs> You know, you know, I had no idea that soap operas were a programming language, but this is what you speak, right? So anyway, I'm here, I'm, I'm asking you, look, you, you know, y'all are really smart and, and we need your help because things are, are getting pretty scary and you might ask like, well, how scary, what do you mean? And I'm like, have you ever seen the never ending story? Like, we're talking like the nothing type level of scary and you're saying, um, aren't we supposed to be talking about joy at this conference? And don't worry, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so, but you know, real quickly about me, um, uh, so, uh, I'm, a, I'm a digital scholarship librarian at UCSD. Everyone always asks me, what does that even mean? Uh, I'm really helping educators, uh, students, researchers think about applying um, emerging technologies in their research and teaching. Um, I have a PhD in the humanities, okay? I'm not trained as a, a, as a computational person. This all happened by accident. I could tell you about that later. Um, and I'm really invest invested in open source um, technology and community-driven software. And I think a lot about ethics and surveillance and control. And I'm also um, a nice person, I think. <laughs> I try. Okay, let's um, get back to the strike. I think it's always great to um, root our conversations and what's happening um, right now. So as um, some of you may know, as um, Josh was certainly new, um, 
uh, there's been concerns in the last few weeks about how educational technology is being used to disempower workers, right? Are, are administrators using, you know, Canvas, the learning management system, to spy on students, to sort of control behavior, to um, maybe get in touch with undergrads, to get them to snitch on their on their TAs? And someone said, yeah, wait, I think NYU did that. Didn't they do that in Blackboard? Yeah, they did, yeah. Um, uh, black, uh, in 2005, grad students at NYU um, were striking, and they were using Blackboard, the, the learning management system, there to kind of spy on the uh, TA's communications with students. Um, okay, interesting. Um, oh, another thing, um, right, uh, the, uh, the, one of the main um, sites for the, the strike these past few weeks has been, I guess, blocked by, um, by the university network. Okay. Um, one thing I want to uh, point out, though, is that student concern with um, technology, and particularly educational technology, is not new, right? There's been um, kind of conversation about this for quite a while. So uh, it came up in the free speech movement, right, in 1964. Here we have a picture of um, the movement happening at the University of California. And um, one of the uh, student leaders, uh, Mario Salvo, uh, on December, um, See, on December 2nd, 1964, you know, stood on the steps of Sproul Hall at UC Berkeley, and he talked about the machine. He talked about this really terrible machine, and he used it as a metaphor to describe the sort of alienating um, forces that were happening. And of course, the, the student movement, I, I know you're all familiar, um, was uh, fighting against, um, uh, or fighting for free speech, um, you know, expressing opposition to the Vietnam War. And I want to show you um, a video of how uh, Mario uh, Salvo was sort of imagining the, the machine. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Not joyful. <laughs> really not joyful. Um, so on that day, uh, 800 students were arrested. Right, basically launching the, the free speech movement into national uh, consciousness. And it's just interesting, right, that the machine sort of metaphorically played a role in the imagination about what, about the sort of dehumanization that was happening um, to students and then, of course, um, more broadly. But the thing is, actually, they, they weren't just using machines as a metaphor, right? Computing technology at the time was becoming an increasingly important tool in managing um, workers and students. And one of the core techno computing technologies at the time is, of course, you all know what this is on the left side, right? It's a yeah, it's a punch card. And so, right, um, students were sort of imagining themselves as punch cards being churned through um, the American university. And as um, Fred Turner tells us in his wonderful um, history um, from counterculture to cyberculture, if you have not read this book, you should read it. Um, you know, students were, were using the punch cards uh, and kind of reappropriating them for. Um, expressions of resistance, right? Like here's the strike, it's punched through the punch card, and this is Dusty um, Miller wearing it. And uh, Fred Turner tells us that one student, there's no photo of this, not that I found, that one student you know, had a sign that said, I am a student of the University of California, please do not fold, spindle, or mutilate me, right? Obviously referring to the, the instructions um, of punch cards. Um, okay, so, um, you know, why do you, why should you care about this? I know probably not all of you are working in higher education, maybe very few of you. In fact, actually, let me know, like, raise your hand if you are associated with higher education in some way. Okay, so a fair, a fair number of you. That's awesome. That's great. Um, so, you know, what I want to kind of convince you all, though, of is that, you know, whether you're working in higher education or not, what's happening technologically in universities matters. Because in many ways, the sort of tools, the values, the practices um, that we expose students to today in relation to computing technology will become dominant tomorrow. And if you don't believe me, you know, just ask this guy, right? Um, in an oral history in 1995, he said, you know, one of the things that built Apple um, to computers was schools buying them, right? And what does he mean by that, right? 
Steve Jobs was really frustrated at um, the sort of slow pace that people were picking up um, personal computing. So he ended up uh, developing all these contracts with the universities and schools to get them to buy Apple II computers, right? Thus financing, you know, the company, but also training a generation uh, of students to really um, value Apple II's vision of computing. Okay, and so what this anecdote highlights, you know, whether you love Apple computers or not, is not really the point. But the, the types of technologies that we expose students to is really going to train them and, and, and train their sort of technological imagination about what's possible, what's normal, um, and so forth. Um, and so I think we all know, right, there's some really exciting possibilities, right? I, we're see, we've, we've seen plenty of talks yesterday, we're going to see more um, today about the sort of exciting future that we might have, the exciting, you know, digital future. But we also know that there's some really kind of scary and dystopic things happening. And I thought, just so we're all on the same page, you know, let's go through them real quickly. We're going to do it quickly because this is a conference about joy, not, not about dystopia. But, you know, in order to get to joy, we have to, we have to face, face dystopia, right? So one of the major concerns right now is surveillance, right? You all know this. Let's go quickly um, through what people are talking about, right? Edward Snowden a few years ago revealed that the NSA, in partnership with uh, several technology companies, um, created this massive global surveillance infrastructure. Um, people were understandably really upset about that. What's happened since? Well, now we just, you know, also have surveillance sort of ubiquitously um, embedded in, in all of our devices and tools that we use, like the phone, of course, um, like your television, like your vacuum cleaner, your Airbnb, your personal assistant, your social media, your search engine, your grocery store. Uh, right, and then we even have more tools that are specifically, you know, for neighbors to spy on, on other people, um, your dating apps, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we all know that. Um, and another thing we're, we're seeing, right, it's not just about, we're not, people aren't just concerned about the surveillance in itself, it's what this is enabling companies to do um, through, through their tools. Um, so, you know, we all know about the Facebook um, mood manipulation uh, experiment, um, which might be valuable, right, if, if we can manipulate moods, turns out certain moods make people more um, susceptible to advertising, so hmm, that's, that's interesting. Um, we know that companies can delete things off of your machine, um, they can slow down your, your uh, device's batteries, um, they can devise things in hopes of making them more addictive. Um, and then they can, you know, possibly even uh, uh, manipulate public discourse. This is debatable, but right, we're, um, we're seeing that actually our, our communication platforms really have a, quite an effect on the way information is sort of passed on and, and how that shapes public understanding of current events. Um, do you remember this? Last fall, Elizabeth Warren um, was uh, sort of calling out Facebook's policy to allow um, candidates or, or politicians to make uh, false uh, ads on, on Facebook. So she said, OK, you really want to do that? I'm going to create an ad that claims that um, Zuckerberg en endorsed Trump's reelection. Um, and so people are right now are pointing to China, right? Like, wow, this is really scary. Look, you know, China's using uh, facial recognition and, and other computational tools to, you know, basically monitor and, and, and influence the behavior of its citizens. You know, isn't that scary? And, you know, hey, actually, maybe we're also doing something um, similar here. Okay. But like, what, you know, what's the problem? Um, so uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> That's reassuring. But you know, we have to talk about it. You know, what do we, what do we, um, what do we think about this? Well, there's been, you know, just an absolute um, explosion of literature from journalists, from from scholars, from concerned citizens about, you know, some of the problems, um, you know, that 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 stem from from these forms of surveillance and control. I'll just go over a few of them, right? Um, are any of you familiar with this book? Yeah, it's a great book, right? Sophia Noble wrote this book called Algorithms of Oppression, and she says, look, you know, search engines um, can, can reinforce racism if we don't have, um, you know, um, the right people sort of um, helping build these systems. Virginia Eubanks uh, wrote a book called Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile Police and, and Punish the Poor, right? Again, another example of how these technologies are exasperating um, uh, existing forms of social um, inequity and, and, and injustice. Um, human rights organizations have said, you know, these, these surveillance giants are really threatening um, human rights. 
Um, here's another book uh, that made a big splash in 2019, controversial, but just to quickly sum up its, its thesis, um, Shoshana Zuboff um, sort of describes this thing she calls surveillance capitalism. And she says this is like a, a new economic logic that aims to predict and modify human behavior as a means to produce revenue, uh, market, and control. And really what she's saying is all those forms of surveillance and control that we just looked at, those aren't bugs, right? We hear this all the time. It's not a bug. It's a feature, right? That these, these are, the, this is the logic, right, driving all, um, driving a, a, a lot of our technology today. And she says what this is causing is the rise of instrumentarian power, right? The power to sort of manipulate behaviors uh, of populations at scale. And she you know, interviews a bunch of people that say, yeah, quite frankly, that, that's what we're doing. The goal of everything we do is to change people's actual behavior at scale. Um, and OK, what's, what's wrong with instrumentarian power? Well, it threatens individual autonomy and, and democratic processes. But, you know, I mean, I don't know if you relate to this. You know, what do you do? I mean, ha have we really changed our behaviors? Have we given up tools that we, we don't think are ethical? I mean, no, not, not at all. Um, um, sorry, let me really moved on from my notes here. Um, you know, right, uh, because, uh, you know, despite our awareness, you know, it, it we still, we, we still embrace these tools, right? Um, and Rob Horning writes about this last September. He said, despite the steady flow of complaints in more and more high profile media outlets about surveillance capitalism, the way it erodes privacy, abolishes trust, extends bias, foments anxiety, invidious competition, on and on and on. This is a great list, by the way. You know, despite all this, many people are still going to go with the flow and get the latest gadgets because, you know, why not? Or, as some journalists have pointed out, it's actually impossible. Um, I don't know if anyone saw this article. It's by Kashmir Hill. She took five weeks and had a whole team of um, expert technologists and you know, a budget to try to figure out how to disentangle herself from these technologies. And she said she actually literally could not do it. Right. So who has five weeks and a, and a surplus budget to sort of disconnect? Not, not me, anyway. Um, OK. So. Um, you know, these, these were the things that I was thinking about, right? The, these, this leaves us with, with a lot of questions, right? Is, is technology bad? Is computing bad? You know, is Western civilization bad? Um, are humans bad? Is capitalism bad? Are we just totally screwed? You know, how, what, do we, what do we do with this information, right? Um, and so that's what I was thinking about as a graduate student in the humanities thinking, you know, maybe, maybe the humanities can help us out here somehow. I don't know why or how. And I came across this book. Does anyone recognize this book? A few people. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, I thought some of you might recognize it because um, even though it's, it's a book that was uh, originally um, published in Brazil, uh, in the 1970s, it had a great, and, and still today, it had great influence on U.S. educators here and uh, sort of launched a movement called critical pedagogy. Anyway, I want to share a little bit with you about this book because um, even though it's, it has nothing to do with technology, it's about pedagogy, right? Teaching, it's about education. Um, it, it surprisingly um, and joyfully offers uh, some ideas about how we might respond to the sort of technological dystopia that we see um, rising up um, all around us. So I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about this book. Uh, it was written by um, a Brazilian educator and philosopher named Paulo Freire, um, who uh, basically in the um, 19, early 1960s uh, was directing a national literacy program in Brazil uh, that w aimed to basically teach millions and millions of um, impoverished Brazilians how to read and write, adults, um, essentially. Um, and if you're not familiar with this uh, period in, in Brazil's history, this was a, a decade of great political unrest. In fact, um, Paulo Freire's work was cut short in 1964 because there was a military coup and he was arrested and uh, eventually exiled to Chile. But um, I wanted to show you these documents because I think they highlight um, sort of where the country was 
Um, at the moment on the left, this is a photo taken by an American photographer um, of one of the, of, of the of a Brazilian um, rural poor child. And on the left um, is a still from a film called Vida Secas, um, Barren Lives, um, which was one of the many films coming out at the time that was really illustrating the sort of struggles of, of these people. Um, okay. So while Freire was uh, educating these people, he came up with this really interesting theory between education um, and oppression. And he says, you know, look, um, you know, so much of what passes for education uh, is really, in fact, teaching people um, to accept the world view of an oppressive class, right? It's, it's preventing people from, from questioning the status quo, from realizing their oppression, and for developing um, greater agency in their lives. And um, I found this little cartoon on the internet um, sort of depicting uh, what Paulo Freire calls the banking model of education. And he says, really, what we're doing in the classroom is, you know, the authoritative instructor is filling, you know, the minds of students with this, this worldview and, you know, orange Kool-Aid in this case. And then when you're done with education, you just think that the world is orange Kool-Aid. You're not actually asking, like, who is that guy? Why is he up there? What's the orange Kool-Aid? Why is he pouring it in here? Is there something... <laughs> you know, better that we could do um, in this case. You know, so for, for Frey, uh, oppression is denying people the right to critically understand and transform the world. And surprisingly, the thesis of his book, education is a very powerful tool in doing that. OK, but it doesn't have to be that way. Let me look at time. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. And so um, he spends his book sort of describing this different um, theory of education, education as liberatory practice. How do you teach people to not accept the, the orange Kool-Aid, to take off the aquarium, and to, to critically understand the world and transform it according to their own needs um, and interests? How do we teach people to have agency? Sorry, I'm lost. Okay. And uh, surprisingly, as I was saying, mentioning before, this book became very um, popular in the U.S. Even though you know the 1960s and 70s um, college student was you know very different than the um, rural poor in Brazil at the time, and yet um, sort of analyzing education for the ways that it that it that it teaches people to conform to the status quo is something that you can apply to educational institutions anywhere, right? Oppression does not need to be an explicitly um, violent um, act. Uh, and just for an example, right, the grade, the letter grade, that's something that we probably all think is sort of natural and neutral. Um, you can also look at the letter grade and see, and see it as a tool that reinforces individualism, right? That reinforces sort of competitive, self-serving interests when you're learning. Um, and so, you know, actually Santa Cruz, right? I, it, does, it, still, it has grades now, right? But historically, it did not have grades at some point. Is that true? Can anyone confirm that? Yeah. Right? And that's really interesting because how is this grade teaching us to, you know, go out into the world and continue to, to try to um, you know, only serve our own learning and, and, our, own, and our, our own selves instead of working collaboratively um, with other people. Uh, we could talk all day about um, different, ways, you know, different ways ideological principles are, are embodied in education. But what I want to talk about is that I find these ideas really relevant to thinking about how computers have been adopted um, by higher education. And you know, one observation I've made is that outside of computer science departments, um, computers have been predominantly adopted as just a neutral utility, as something to make the university processes you know, quicker, more efficient, easier, right? Think of um, learning management systems, word processors, email, web search, et cetera, et cetera, right? <laughs> Um, and in many ways, they ha they've been, um, you know, people really like these tools. They've made things easier, uh, easier to do. But um, at the same time, something really sneaky has happened, right? As we're adopting these technologies, as we're adopting the Apple II in, in the 80s, um, we're also adopting um, the sort of dominant view of computing at the time, right? Which is a black box form of computing where users have little expectation of being able to go into their machines and to, to change them according to their own um, needs and interests. Oops. And of course, 
you know, as I, I often speak to folks who, who only know this model of computing, right? But we're at a conference now where all of you are tinkerers. And so, of course, you know that there have, in fact, been many other um, models of computing throughout the years. Um, the Scandinavian trade unions in the 1960s advocated for the rights of workers to code design information technologies in their workplace. Um, <laughs> Alan Kay uh, had this idea for a Dyna book where students would be program their computers from, from the ground up. Um, Ted Nelson, right? Any nitwit can understand computers, and many do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good quote, right? You know? Unfortunately, due to ridiculous historical circumstances, computers have been made a mystery to most of the world. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm low on time, so I'm going to go quickly. The Free Software Foundation, of course. Uh, more recently, platform co-op movements. Okay, I'm just going to speed uh, right ahead. And one thing that I think we've lost by adopting this, you know, dominant model of computing is um, we've lost the ability to give sort of the, you know, the the larger student body the uh, the ability to creatively tinker with their tools. And one thing that's really interesting is you go back in the history in the 80s, and there there in fact were a lot of educators and students who were not in the computer science department that were doing all sorts of creative things. Um, with their computing technologies. Do you want to see one? Yeah, OK, cool, good. Um, oh, sorry, for before that, right? Um, you know, they were aware of this, because Fred Kemp says in 1987, why is it after more than seven years of imaginative and innovative work by all these people um, on writing programs specifically, um, where we still have this really boring you know, word processor. You know, universities are just adopting you know, uh, word processors that are all about grammar and, and things like that. Uh, okay, so here is one I want to show you. I'm really excited about this. There's many more. We don't have much time, though. So, um, Hugh Burns, 1979. Hugh Burns was a graduate student in composition, um, and he created a writing program inspired by a philosopher, inspired by Aristotle. I mean, what does that even mean? And really, it's, it's sort of a chat program. Um, students, while they're working on their essays, would chat with this bot and um, sort of develop ideas for, for, their, um, for their paper. And this is, sort, sorry, it's a, a sort of poor um, copy here. But one thing I wanted to point out is it's a fun, it's a joyful program. It's hilarious, right? Like here, they're, they're, he's talking at this point, or the computer is talking at this point with a student um, about their topic on the fear of death. And you know, the computer says, holy electronics. That's weird. I used to date a computer interested in the fear of death, right? <laughs> I mean, how fun. So, you know, I hope showing this to you makes you realize, like, wouldn't it be great if everyone was developing weird writing programs based on their favorite philosophers or artists or, you know, things, things like that. Um, so, right, I think we've sort of lost a joyful approach um, in computing for the masses, certainly not for, for you guys, but for, you know, the, the broader um, population. But I think that that's not the only thing we've lost. Uh, we've also lost a more kind of critical participatory relationship with our tools that is allowing really scary things to happen in um, educational technology um, more broadly because all those forms of surveillance and control that we just looked at are also right now entering um, education, right? Um, so the EFF just published this like two days ago. Schools are operating as test beds for mass surveillance with no evidence and no way to opt out. Let me just show you quickly a few of these. Um, so I'm going to go quickly because I only have a few more minutes. But um, what, what is driving this surveillance? Uh, the value of student data, right? So in 2013, McKinsey Global Institute said, you know what? That student data could be worth as much as $890 billion to $1.2 trillion annually. That's a lot of money. And so companies, of course, are moving in on that. Are, have you folks heard of Turnitin, the plagiarism uh, company, right? Has over 300 million student papers um, locked in on its servers. It sold last year for $1.75 billion to a media company, not even to an educational company. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you are aware, but Instructure right now, the company that um, produce, provides uh, Canvas, the learning management system, is right now negotiating a deal for $2 billion. And again, like the, the value of these companies, right, it's not just the software, it's the data um, that they have. Um, even our scholarly publishers are no longer calling themselves scholarly publishers, they're calling themselves you know, research analytics companies. Um, and there's a lot of different you know, scary stuff here I'm going to pass over, you can just look at it, wristbands, oh. Oh. it's too much. 
That's too much. Oh, this one, Gaggle monitors all e student email and digital communication, you know, to, to make sure that you're not a threat to, to other students. That, that one's fun. Okay. Um, okay. 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 What, okay. <laughs> um, what do we do? Okay, first I just want to tell you, look, that I'm not the only person talking about this. Um, there are a lot of really exciting people working in, edu in education or as writers or librarians that are, are doing really important work. Um, this is only a few of them. Um, you know, Chris Gilliard, uh, who's right here, um, he writes about this and says, you know, actually, students are, are really angry about, about these forms of surveillance, but they just don't see any alternatives. You know, if, we're, if higher education is to, quote, save the web, we really need to enact right, this better web in the classroom, and we're certainly not doing that right now. Um, here's Jessamine. Jessamine is up there on the left. Um, Jessamine is a Vermont librarian doing all this really exciting um, library, sorry, gosh, library activism um, around uh, digital technology. Um, there's a hybrid pedagogy lab. They, you know, look, there's Palo Freire right there. Um, they're also uh, uh, thinking about more critical approaches to digital technology and higher ed. Um, so here's a lot of projects. Digital Library Fed Federation has the Technologies of Surveillance Group. Um, okay, I'm going to speed along. What, what these are all doing, I think, is they're showing the importance of exposing students to different models and values of technological practice. Um, I've been doing this kind of work, too. When I was a graduate student, um, I helped develop a, um, a platform for socializing student writing and feedback. Um, it was really fun just for that functionality. But what was really important to me is that it was a space where students could actually start designing the, the technologies that they were using in their education. And although we didn't get to enact this, um, you know, it was, it was sort of striving to also allow students to govern these, these platforms, to give them experience in, in sort of creating the policies around data and things like that. Um, and so here's another beta uh, or a screenshot of the the activity feed and so forth. Right now, I lead a digital commons, a non-commercial digital commons in San Diego, oops, for, um, for, um, for five different institutions of higher education. We have uh, about 2,400 members, and it's really a place where you know, students can create these discussion groups and create websites and things like that. But um, what I'm really excited about is that we have a student research group that gets together and we read about critical issues in technology and educational technology, and then we think about how would we like to further develop NIT according to our own creative interest and our sort of political concerns about educational technology. Um, I also um, run Ethical Ed Tech uh, with Nathan Schneider, who's at the University of Colorado Boulder. And this is a, a wiki and a learning community. Um, the wiki is really a place where um, we invite the community to um, put information up about you know, more ethical alternatives to technologies than the, than the sort of surveillance technologies we see in education right now. Um, we also do webinars and invite people working in this space to talk about um, their experiences. Um, this was a really great edit-a-thon edit on strategic refusal where we heard from ed tech workers um, about their experiences in refusing to provide certain tools to universities based on the, the different types of surveillance um, um, they embodied. And what are the risks of that as an ed tech worker in refusing to, to do it, you know, to serve, to provide a tool that, that your employer is telling you <coughs> to use? Um, and we also collaborate with other activists in this space. Um, so uh, Christina uh, uh, Kolkuhan uh, wrote a petition to Instructure, that, that company we just talked about, about their use of student data. And that, in fact, um, got this Ed Surge article written up about the concerns over, over their student data that I, I showed you just a minute ago. And then finally, um, an another project I've worked on, right, I don't think this is just about technology. I think it's also about raising awareness. So um, I worked with uh, Autumn Keynes. Uh, on creating this remixable pr student privacy statement um, that basically any educator can put on their um, syllabus to sort of uh, just let students know that they should maybe be thinking about how their, um, their student data is being used by these companies and hopefully just trying to not normalize the fact that we're allowing surveillance to just kind of happen, happen in our educational spaces. Um, okay, so these are ways that I've been, you know, trying to apply um, Freire's uh, liberatory practice to um, educational technology. Um, I'm, I see higher education as a site for liberating the technological imagination from the digital status quo. 
And what I mean just by liberatory technological consciousness is, you know, the right and capacity to critically understand and transform the tech that we use, the belief that collective governance and development um, of technology matters, you know, the study of the influence of this technology on our practices um, from the point of view of the users, not just the administrators, sorry. Um, and the belief that technology is always an unfinished project, right, um, in need of our continued collective understanding and transformation. Um, why does it matter? Well, because we need students to be prepared to, you know, shape, shape a better um, digital future. And, you know, not, not, not this. Not that. Not that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I, I think, you know, as I said, the imagination is, is a really important part of this, which is why I was so excited to see Rachel Carson um, quoted yesterday in, in the opening talk. She's talking about wonder, right? It's wonder, it's joy, it's imagination. We really need to preserve that, that vision um, of computing. Um, and, and why I think it's so exciting that you brought up Rachel Carson, right? She, uh, of course, is the author of Silent Spring. Are you all familiar with Silent Spring, right? It was one of the books that sort of kicked off the environmental um, movement in the US and, and sparked the imagination and made people care, um, right? And I think her work has really led to the, the profound movement that we see happening today. And I, and I think we need something similar for computing, right? And this is what I think you all are all ready doing, right? By, by, by exploring the sort of joyful um, possibilities of, of what we can do with these tools. You know, when, when you have power and agency over, the t uh, over these tools and showing people the value of that, that's really, um, really important. So what I, I just want to invite you to do is see, um, you know, to see what you're doing as part of Frere's um, liberatory practice and, and see that your joy of computing, you know, isn't just for fun, it's for a better future. So thank you very much.